Marilyn Horn. Jackie, you've still got a busier diary than most active singers. What drives you to keep working for people who want to sing? I keep asking myself that. I'm, I'm not quite sure. It must be that uh, I enjoy it, and I, I certainly enjoy being able to aid and abet young singers, help them along. I, I really like teaching very, very much, and because I do have so many contacts and friends uh, in the world, I'm able to also help them in many other ways, pick up the phone and call somebody and maybe just say, so-and-so is auditioning for you today or tomorrow. Uh, open up your ears, especially for this singer, because I think this singer is special. People call me and ask me if I could please cast their next uh, Beethoven Ninth or Mozart Requiem or something like that, which I'm always delighted to do because I have a long list of singers who've passed my way that I just you know, have a great joy to recommend. This informal, extracurricular, extramural activity that you take on, the masterclasses, the academies, the foundation, all of that, is that to fill a gap that you feel has opened out? I'm not really sure because I just sort of fell into all of it. I didn't really have a plan, to tell you the truth. I had not thought too much about teaching. In fact, I didn't even know if I could teach. Some friends have said to me, well, you're just, you're crazy. You've been teaching always because, say, in a rehearsal, a young singer might be singing and I would walk up and say, why are you singing that like that? <laughs> or something <laughs> lovely, you know? <laughs> so when I was asked to take over the uh, voice department duties at uh, the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara, where I also went to school when I was 19, I said yes. And that just started the whole ball rolling. And then I just began to get asked to teach in many places. So what I'm ending up doing basically is traveling a lot. And I go to various music schools in universities or private and spend maybe a week teaching a residency, shall we say, where I teach uh, master classes, some close to the just only the students, some open to the public, and then lots of private lessons. You must so, have a bigger Rolodex of young singers than the director of any I opera do. house. I do. I really do. You had voice training at eight years old. Oh, actually, earlier, I had started my first formal lessons at five, which, of course, I don't recommend for anybody. But in my more mature years, I realized what it was all about. It was because of Shirley Temple. She was the big star of the movies in the Depression. And there was this little three-year-old girl singing and dancing. And they didn't think anything about the fact that I could maybe do that too, it, since I obviously showed evidence of being able to sing very, very early. And your parents thought you could end up as the next child sensation? I think perhaps that might have been behind it. I wasn't, though. <laughs> <laughs> but the family went to California, which is where stars are made. Right. Did they think you were going to be a movie star? Did you think you were going to be a movie star? Never. They may have, but they didn't say it to me. But you were um, also doing duos for yeah, Hollywood that, soundtracks. That, but that happened when I was about 12. We started doing a lot of background music for the movies. And the kids around you, the other people who are doing it, they probably all had their eyes set on the movies, whereas you were already focused on music? I'm not sure. I you to tell you the truth, everybody was pretty much focused on singing. I can tell you that working in the movies was a marvelous way to earn money. That's one of the things that was a big attraction. Was it also a marvelous way to learn music? There were a lot of really interesting people around. Yes, there were. And I'm very fortunate that I had that experience. You know, now there are many books coming out about those years in Los Angeles where we had all basically the refugees from Hitler. Not necessarily in the movies, but there were a lot of wonderful people who worked in the movies, mostly men, of course, in the music end of it, the composing end of it. And I also had many teachers and coaches who had that same experience of coming from Europe. Do you remember that also at school, that there were 
kids in your class who were perhaps refugees in the same ways that you'd been displaced? Not so many. I can tell you what I definitely remember because I lived in Long Beach, which is 16, 17 miles from the center of L.A. And what we had, which was fascinating because we moved there just after the whole war was over, we had all of the Japanese students being released from the internment camps. That was very interesting. I didn't really realize how interesting it was at the time, but I definitely remember we had all of these students. These were Japanese Americans? Absolutely, yeah. And, and they'd spent the war locked up? The Japanese were interned in California during the war, and they came out and came to our schools. And we interacted, you know, like any other students. It was just fine. But that was interesting, you know, because I came from this small town in Pennsylvania that basically immigrants were there, but they were Italians or Polish or something like that. I hadn't experienced, first of all, almost zero blacks and Hispanics, forget that. We didn't have those either. And there was not a Japanese family that I know existed in that small town, about 10,000 people. You were a product of the Californian melting pot. I was, yes. And you made what you now call pirate recordings, which are cover versions of pop hits. Right. You were imitating Peggy Lee in yes. Lover When I'm Near You. Yes, that's right. That was, again, all for money. Mm-hmm. By then, I was in university. I went to University of Southern California. And a friend of mine who was singing with me in a cappella choir and madrigal singer said, you know, I'm making these recordings and we could use you to be in the, I guess, backup music, you'd say, for $40 a session. That was a lot of money in 1951. So, again, it was a money deal and I really relied on my mimicry because I very quickly went from being backup music to being one of the soloists. And I have good ears for mimicking and I used it. What can I tell you? (laughs) (laughs) Did you never think this might be the easier option? Forget about opera. Why don't I go into becoming a pop singer? Why don't I become Lena Horne? Our dear Lena, she just died. Yeah. Isn't that, I'm so sad. She was somebody that I greatly admired and I knew somewhat. Yeah, I'm sad that she's gone. She was a great, great artist. She came to your first Carmen at the Met, didn't she? Yes, she did. She certainly did. And I remember so many wonderful evenings hearing her in, in nightclubs and uh, you know, I guess one would call a cabaret now, mainly, and her incredible one-woman show on Broadway that was just staggering. But in any event, I did dabble with pop music because I could sing it. You know, the pop music of our day was singable. It's not like today's. And therefore, I did a lot of it. And yeah, I I could have swung either way, but the music of classical music was definitely pulling me. That's, that's I think, what it was all about in the end, having the talent, but then also being able to live with all that great music. The first Carmen you sang was voice track in the movie Carmen Jones. That's right. With Dorothy Dandridge and Harry Belafonte. Right. Uh, Did you think that was a good idea, turning grand opera into soap and pop? I thought it was fine. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I thought it was fine. Also, if you ever make a study, Norman, of the lyrics that Hammerstein wrote, they're ingenious. I saw it at 16. I was I was bowled over. I hadn't seen a Carmen in the Opera House. I thought it was great. You saw the movie? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. And I was 20 when I did it. Again, it was this thing of making money. I was at university and I needed every dollar I could get to pay for my lessons and everything else. And a friend of mine said, they're hiring white people to sing in the soundtrack and we can make a lot of money. And I said, great, I'm going to go audition. And so I called and got an audition. But unfortunately, or fortunately, they sent me to the wrong audition. They sent me to the audition where people were auditioning to be the singers, the, to dub the voices of the actors. And I sang Michaela Zaria in French. That was my audition piece. But again, I I was sitting there listening to the other ladies sing, and they were a lot of them singing the Hammerstein version of the Habanera. And I've never been shy about 
putting myself forward, I just said, you know, I can sing low, too. And, and the wonderful conductor, Herschel Gilbert, said to me, would you like to sing the Habanera? I said, well, I've never sung it, but I know it for sure. And he said, can you just read the Hammerstein lyrics? I said, sure. And that was that. And within very short order, they asked me to come in the next day, I think it was, and do a little more singing for the role of Carmen. That was a surprise, though. I didn't expect that. In college, you met the Vienna legend Lotte Lehmann, and a philanthropist paid her to give you lessons. Was she rough on you? Not in the beginning. I think my first gig with her was a master class at USC, and I remember I sang my very first German Lied. I was 17, and it was Die Junge Nonne of Schubert. And she was fine, and I did more classes with her. Later on, when I was at the Music Academy in Santa Barbara with her, she let fly on me one day. <laughs> and uh, What did she say? Well, she just really badly criticized my German, and I'm sure that it needed criticizing, but not in the way she did it. And I learned a lesson that day. I didn't think about it at the time, to tell you the truth, but somewhere the seed was planted that if I ever did public master classes, I would never be that um, hard on a student in public. She told you also that if you want to be an opera singer, you don't have children. Oh, yes, that was another time, yes. And that was I was already pregnant. <laughs> she could be a tough lady. There's no question about that. She heard somebody say, Jackie, I hear you're pregnant. And I wasn't showing, I guess, too much at that time. I said, yes. And she turned around, and this other person said, what do you want, a boy or a girl? And I said, I don't care. I want a healthy baby. And she said, and I, I am not exaggerating this, she said, well, I hope it'll be a Null, and she said she spoke to me in German, and we know that Null means nothing, because singers shouldn't have children. Well, I can tell her, wherever she is, she was wrong, because also you have a wonderful baby and child and grown up, and then you have grandchildren, which is the glory of your old age. <laughs> While we're on memory lane, Jackie, how did you get to meet Stravinsky? We have a wonderful organization in Los Angeles. It was originally called Evenings on the Roof and then became known as the Monday Evening Concerts, where basically new music and really old music were the foundation of these concerts. You were and singing madrigals. Madrigals and also solos, absolutely, mm. soloists, yeah. Mm -hmm. By then, you see, it was in my late teens, and I was beginning to be known as a I guess, a dependable singer around town in Los Angeles. So I was being called to come and sing uh, lots of concerts. So that's how it happened. And it, this particular one was the music of Stravinsky. And I worked it with him. And he actually taught me my very first Russian. They were some Russian folk songs of his. And the relationship grew from then. And then I worked very closely with his assistant at the time, Robert Kraft. We did lots of Jesualdo madrigals. I, mm -hmm. I, I lay claim to having recorded 65 Jesualdo madrigals and motets. <laughs> <laughs> and also things like the Monteverdi Vespers, you're singing that. That was a big deal because I don't think it had ever been performed in Los Angeles. That was the kind of rep that we did in those concerts. Isn't there something that Stravinsky said about you? He said, the good Lord knows everything, but Jackie knows better. I don't think he said that, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it got quoted. You know, I always remember with um, John Huston, and he said whether you should do the legend or you should do what's true. And he said, go with the legend every time. <laughs> there was also a story that you told Hindemith that he didn't understand Baroque style. I, you know, again, I don't think I ever did that. I remember it was fun. I was asked to sing with him at the first time in Vienna, and we got to know each other. And Jesualdo was one of the first things that I did with him. And he was amazed to find out that I already knew the madrigals. And then we talked about another piece of Monteverdi's, and he said that he wanted to do that, which I did with him in concert. And I said, I've already sung this. And he was just where did you do all of this? I said, at the University of Southern California. 
And he couldn't believe that an American, let alone a Californian, could do these things. I think that was probably part of it. But the fact that I was up front and cheeky enough to say, but I know these songs already. <laughs> <laughs> it was Stravinsky's assistant, Robert Kraft, who helped you go to Europe after your father died in 1956. Well, no, I actually, that's not quite accurate either. Okay. Sorry to... No, um, no, no, no. Keep correcting the legend. <laughs> <laughs> I got myself to Europe. That was, okay. I, I, I had decided before my father died, actually, because he died suddenly, I had already decided that that was going to be my road. Now, we're talking about 1956, mm -hmm. and the German opera houses were very, very interesting to aspire to in those days because of the fact there were so many of them, and we didn't have them in the United States. You know, in those days, we just barely had some regional companies in the United States. It was very different. So if you really wanted to get your opera legs from the ground up, you really sort of had to go there. And again, I had all these teachers who had come out of that system and recommended it very, very highly to me. And as a matter of fact, at the time, I was offered a contract to go to the New York City Opera, and I turned it down because I guess I had been brainwashed enough or I, you know, actually did have some smarts and thought this would be the better route for me. I never, ever regretted it. It was really the best kind of experience anyone can get. And you did four years hard ground in provincial I, Gelsenkirchen. I did three years there. I did a year studying in Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hard grind. But again, you know, if you're enjoying what you're doing, that makes it much less hard. And in 1960, you make the breakthrough as Marie in Wozzeck. That's a, a pretty dangerous role to go with. Tough on you, tough on the audience. You know... Um, no, none of the German girls in the house was prepared to put their hands up and say, we'll do it? Well, I don't think they were asked to. You know, you were assigned what you were supposed to sing. Mm -hmm. And when you were under a fest contract like that, mm -hmm. and uh, I was assigned Marie, and, and I actually was terrified of it because one always had heard this kind of thing is, is a voice breaker. And I had sung enough of Schoenberg and Webern and that kind of music with Robert Kraft and other people in Los Angeles that I knew how difficult it was. I do not have absolute pitch, and that is a liability, actually, when you're going to sing 12-tone music, but I had been experienced in it. And at the time, I told my music director that I didn't want to do it because I thought it was a voice breaker, as we say, and uh, he was quite insistent. I don't think we argued or anything, but I, I made him a deal. And I don't even know if it would have held up, but I said, I'll learn the first scene. And if I feel that I can sing it without killing myself, I'll do it. My agent in Vienna told me if I did it, he wouldn't manage me anymore. A lot of people said, you're too young, you're too blah, blah, blah. You were 25. You know, I was 26 at the time. Okay. I learned that first scene and I thought, well, this, this feels pretty good. <laughs> this doesn't seem to tax me beyond my vocal resources and started to learn the rest of it. And I so then I said, okay, I'll do it. I went against a lot of heavy tide, but I felt somehow that it was just really right for me. And boy, was I right. <laughs> From the age of 17, you'd been seeing Henry Lewis on and off. He was a double bass player in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He was a year older than you. And nobody wanted you to marry him because he was black. What was it your mother said? She said, go and be his mistress, don't marry him. Oh, right. Yes, mm. absolutely. She did say that, which is quite astounding for somebody like my mother who came out of a white bread small town in Pennsylvania, Protestant ethic, the whole thing, to even consider that someone should live in sin rather than be married. And Roger Wagner, your chorus director, said if you married a black man, you were finished in America. That's right. He did. It said my career would be over. And I hate the word career, but I can't think of a better one. I got a lot of lovely advice like that, but they were all wrong. It's amazing. You must have been pretty sure of yourself oh, to yes. resist all of that. Sure, but also unsure. 
Mm. That's what was difficult, was going ahead with what I really wanted to do in marrying Henry, but f feeling all of those doubting voices in my head. That was not easy. That gave me some unsteady moments, but he was the object of my affections. Were you prepared for the prejudice that you'd face afterwards, the looks that you got, um, perhaps in, in, in the southern states, places you couldn't go together? We didn't go there together. Just didn't go? Mm. <laughs> no. I'm not even sure that we did that as a rule. It was a question that I was basically only going to the southern states to sing recitals, and that was by myself with my accompanist. So we weren't in those places. I was prepared, yes. I expected it, and it was never really as bad as I expected, and I think that's because we were in showbiz, and showbiz people are generally much more open-minded to anything that's controversial. So that made it a lot easier. And my mother came around after a couple of weeks. She realized that she had made a very big mistake by not attending our wedding and uh, apologized to me and said it was a big mistake the whole, you know, for on her part. But, you know, I, I understood her. She thought her world was also going to come crashing around her. And um, that was that.